Hi, my name is Dylan, and this video will be about Chapter 16 of the Barron's AP Economics book. As always, I will be covering what you need to know for the AP Economics exam. The topics covered in this chapter are essential for a good understanding of macroeconomics. These top topics include aggregate demand and aggregate supply, business cycles, classical and Keynesian economic theories, MPC or marginal propensity to consume, and multipliers. So a business cycle is what all economies operate in. Businesses have periods of high growth and periods of poor growth, and these periods will dramatically influence the economy. As a result, there will be large fluctuations in the economy. Periods of high growth are called expansion periods, and periods of decline are called recessions. They are unpredictable as to when they will happen, but they will reliably occur. One business cycle will consist of one expansion and one recession. So there are many schools of economic thought, and one such school is called classical economics. Classical economics base their theories on Say's law, which states that supply is the source of demand. Basically, it means that when suppliers sell stuff, they will get money to buy other stuff, which creates demand. If they have trouble selling their products, sellers will drop their prices and everything will sell then. Classical economics also states that supply is the most important factor in the determining the output for a good. Supply is determined and supply in turn is determined by the technology and resources available for production. However, classical economics is very theoretical and not 100% accurate. Another major economic school of thought is called Keynesian economics. Keynes believed that the Great Depression is caused by lack of spending or low demand. His big idea was that recessions and depressions could be solved by increasing government spending to generate more demand. Aggregate supply refers to the supply of all goods and services in a nation. There are a couple of supply curves that you need to know, and each one reflects a different school of thought. Classical economics states that the supply curve is vertical because prices have no effect on output. This is because even though higher prices will incentivize businesses to produce more, higher prices also mean the higher cost of out inputs. Also, in classical economics, only resources and technology can affect output. However, the Keynesian supply curve is upsloping because in a recession, if prices go up, businesses will have more incentive to increase output, and input costs won't really change because in a recession, it's very easy to increase output. So here are the graphs for an aggregate supply. The one on the left here shows Keynesian economics, and one on the right shows classical economics. So notice the Keynesian one is upsloping, as I said before, but I labeled it SRAS, which means short run aggregate supply. So the Keynesian model is the supply curve in the short run, because in the short run, input prices will take some time to fully adjust after the price level increases for goods. So therefore, output can increase with the increase in price. However, in the long run, any change in price level will be met with an equal change in input prices. Therefore, no additional output can be gained from a change in prices. The max output is at YF, or this point right here, um, called full employment. And the only way to increase supply is to increase resources or change, change productivity. So, as I said before, the supply curve can only be changed with a change in technology or productivity and a change in resource availability. So the counterpart to aggregate supply is called aggregate demand. And aggregate demand is a demand for all goods and services in a nation. An important concept related to aggregate demand is called the MPC, or the marginal propensity to consume. It's a number that shows how much people will spend per, extra, per given extra dollar. If my MPC is 0.85 and I get another dollar, that means I'll keep 15 cents and I'll spend 85 cents. MPC also, MPC also relates spending to income. If people get more money, they will also spend more. So the curve for aggregate demand is downsloping, like a regular demand curve. This is because overall spending is less at higher prices due to a couple of reasons. First off, when prices go up, people also make more money because their companies profit more and pay their workers more. However, foreign incomes don't change with the increase in prices, and this means that less goods will be exporting, decreasing total spending. Also, the higher prices will lead to more inflation. Banks will charge higher interest rates to compensate, and with higher interest rates, businesses and people will borrow less money and therefore spend less money. Aggregate demand can also change with a few variables. A change in money supply can change aggregate demand, an example of monetary policy, which will be explained in a later chapter. A change in government spending can also change AD, or aggregate demand, because there will be change in the overall demand for goods and services. 
This is known as fiscal policy, which will be explained later as well. Tax cuts and increases can also change AD, another example of fiscal policy. And lastly, interest rates will change aggregate demand. So another graph to remember is called the consumption function. This graph models spending and income. At equilibrium, an economy will be exactly at the break-even point, where the economy will spend exactly the amount it earns. So this slide here shows the graph of the consumption point. The y-axis is equal to the spending, and the x-axis is equal to GDP or income. The dotted line, this dotted line right here, is a, is a 45 degree line, which means that any point on it is equal to one dollar spent for every dollar earned. So the consumption function is shown with the sm smaller slope, so that it's higher initially and lower after the break-even point. And this is the break-even point. The higher points show that with low money, people will spend more money than they earn, and the, at the, this point shows that people will spend less than they earn. So that means that people are saving. If the economy is left of the break-even point, the high spending means that businesses need to keep up with high demand. They will hire more workers, which means more income for people, and then it means that spending will increase to here. If it's the right, it means that people are not spending enough money, and businesses will fire some workers, and this will cause income to de decrease the break-even point. So the next topic is called the, multi the multiplier effect. Notice on the consumption function that the slope is really small. This means that a small change in price can lead to a huge change in income. Why? The answer lies in the MPC, or the marginal propensity to consume. When you buy something, that money goes to someone else and it becomes their income. They will spend a portion of it based on the MPC, and the money gets transferred to someone else, and this person will keep spending it, and this will keep occurring until no more money is left. So for every $1 increase in spending, there will be a much larger increase in income because the money will flow to lots of people. The multiplier is a way to calculate it. Well, the multiplier is equal to 1 divided by 1 minus marginal propensity to consume. And the change in income is equal to the marginal, um, change is equal to the multiplier times change in spending. If I have a multiplier of 5, this means that for every $1 change in spending, income will change by $5. That's it for this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something from this video.